Welcome to science class. Today we are going to learn what makes good soil. Soil covers nearly every surface of Earth, outside of ice sheets or sand deserts, but they aren't all created equal. As we saw in the last video, if you take any sample of regolith or soil, you find that it's actually composed of a variety of sediment sizes. This variation is impossible to identify or appreciate without special tools. But there are even more important structural characteristics that are so small that we pretty much can't see them at all. Here are photographs I took of three different soil types using an electron microscope. Even at this microscopic level, you really can't find the difference. Yet, one of these samples would be very good for growing crops, and the other two would be terrible, but in different ways. But the regolith is just one factor. The types of organisms, the availability of nutrients, the climate, the topography, there are a lot of factors that determine the productivity of soils. Let's get started. It takes thousands of years for mature soil to form, and there are many factors involved in soil formation. Let's talk about parent material. This is the source for the regolith that makes soil. When soil forms directly on top of its parent material, we call it residual soil. In other areas, especially along river valleys, the soil is made of eroded sediments from different geographic areas. We call this transported soil. Transported soil is far more productive. When it comes to soil regolith, variety is key. Rivers carry sediment from far and wide, and rivers join with other rivers. So the variety of parent material that a river carries can be great. This ensures that a healthy mixture of trace elements that plants need to grow are present in transported soil. There's a word for sediments that are transported by water, alluvium. Another critical factor in soil formation is time. That is, time for many of the other processes to take effect. Chemical weathering transforms the soil into something very different from what the parent material is, but that takes a long time. If an area goes through a lot of unrest through volcanic eruptions or glaciation or some other factors, mature soils don't always form. So when we say time affects soil formation, you should think the right conditions over time. The most important factor that determines soil productivity by far is climate. The temperature and precipitation an area experiences controls the rate, depth, and type of soil created. Climate also shapes the kinds of living things that interact with and grow in the soil. Fun fact, earthworms did not live in the upper United States or Canada before Columbus arrived. They had been driven out by multiple periods of glaciation that accompanied the ice ages. They now cover these areas thanks mostly to the accidental reintroduction of them by immigrants from Europe. But earthworms are a crucial member of the soil because they slowly mix and till the soil. Throughout the world, there are biomes. These are large communities of specific plants and animals that live in a particular habitat. Far north, there is the tundra where no trees can grow because the majority of the soil never thaws out. That portion of the soil is called permafrost. Plants can still grow here and there are animals, but it's pretty sparse. Below the tundra sit the taigas of Canada and Russia. These are the largest forests on the planet, and they contain conifers, evergreen trees, since that is the only type of tree that could survive the winters there. Warmer climates give way to grasslands, temperate forests, tropical rain, tropical dry forests, and so on. These biomes and the type of soil they develop depend solely on the climate in shaping their characteristics. As I mentioned in the first soil video, there's a strange pattern with biomes and soils. The rainforests, which host more species of plant and animal than anywhere else on land, have the worst soils. A combination of too much rain washing away the nutrients and the ferocious competition for nutrients means that all nutrients are locked within the living things and virtually none of it is stored or builds up in the soil. The living things themselves are another factor in soil formation. Plants supply the majority of humus in soil, and decomposers like bacteria and fungi break down the organic matter into usable forms. Plants also slow down soil erosion. At the beginning of this video, I talked about characteristics of soil that you can't see. Let's talk about those. 
Soil needs trace elements, things that are there, but in tiny quantities. A healthy adult needs around 300 grams of carbohydrates and 150 grams of protein a day. But you also need, for example, around 900 micrograms of vitamin A. You can't live without vitamin A, but the amount you require is microscopic compared to other nutrients. The bulk of soil is regolith, water, and organic matter, but mixed within that are small amounts of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus that plants need or they cannot grow. That's what we will cover now. The atmosphere is around 78% nitrogen, and nitrogen is a major component in DNA and amino acids in our bodies. But when you breathe in the nitrogen in the air, nothing happens. Plants can't absorb atmospheric nitrogen either, so how do we get the nitrogen our bodies need? Well, you and I, and other animals, get it from our diet. We eat plants or other animals. But the original source for the nitrogen comes from bacteria. There's a class of certain bacteria that do what's called nitrogen fixation. They are the only organisms that can take the nitrogen from the air and convert it into solid compounds. This is similar to what plants do by absorbing carbon dioxide gas and building carbohydrates with it. But in this case, the bacteria are making nitrates. These bacteria live in the soil and can constantly make nitrogen compounds that plants absorb and then incorporate into their tissues. Some plants have nodules in their roots where these kinds of bacteria live. These plants are known as legumes. Peanuts and soybeans are legumes and they are used in crop rotation. If you plant corn season after season, you will eventually exhaust all of the nitrogen in your soil and crops will no longer grow. Legumes make more nitrogen than they use. Nitrogen can also be gathered by plants through decomposition, which produces ammonium. In either case, it is the plants that first absorb the nitrogen compounds, then we eat the plants or other animals that eat plants. Phosphorus is another element found in our DNA and in proteins, but it's also in our bones and teeth. Phosphorus is a very common element in the rocks that produce the regolith in soil itself. But that phosphorus in the soil can't always be used. One problem is that phosphorus does not cycle like other compounds. Nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, water, these are all found in the atmosphere, which helps them spread around. Phosphorus does not enter the atmosphere. So instead, phosphorus needs to be made available by chemical processes in the soil. Water is a good solvent, so it can release phosphorus, making it available. When we say available with regard to nutrients, that means the nutrients are able to be absorbed by plants, and they get into plants by being dissolved in water. It's possible to have nutrients in your soil, but they won't dissolve into water, therefore they are unavailable. For phosphorus, the pH of the soil determines this. At a certain range of pH, phosphorus cannot be released from the regolith and absorbed by plants, while at other pH values, it is readily available. The ideal pH is just below 7. 7 is neutral on the pH scale. Rainwater naturally has a mild acidity to it, so phosphorus is usually available. Potassium is the final trace element we will talk about. Potassium and phosphorus have the same limitations in that they are locked within the regolith and it isn't always available. Within the soil structure, you'll remember there is clay, but the clay particles are really small. Clay particles at this level form these layers that almost look like scales. These layers are tightly packed and the gaps are so small that they don't even allow water to fit between them. The only place where water can dissolve potassium is on the exposed edges of these clay particles. The majority of the potassium is hidden away inside and releases slowly. Potting soil typically includes nitrogen and potassium compounds that can be more easily dissolved. Here on this label, you can see this potting soil specifically says that it contains soluble potash. K is the atomic symbol for potassium, and soluble means it can be dissolved by water. Finally, I want to cover a couple of very good soils and why they are so productive, and a few of the bad soils and what makes them unproductive. The first is andesol. Andesol is soil that forms from volcanic ash. Specifically, the parent material for andesol is called tephra, Tephra is any group of rocks that are ejected by volcanoes. 
Lots of people historically have lived near volcanoes. Pompeii comes to mind. There's also Mount Fujiyama in Japan. Look at this volcano in New Zealand. The perfect ring that forms around it is from deforestation. A few hundred years ago, the entire area was dark green with forest, but people have moved in and cleared the land out for agriculture and cities. Volcanic ash doesn't really seem like it would make a great soil, but it does. Why is that? I used to think that it was because the ash comes from deep within the earth, so it must be rich with minerals and essential components that plants need. But that's not the real reason. Remember that in order for nutrients to be considered available, they need to be dissolved so they can be absorbed by plants. Volcanic ash dissolves very quickly because the ash particles are microscopic. That is the real reason Andesol is so productive. Next are the prairie soils that make up the United States' breadbasket. We already took a look at this on satellite imagery. How can so much food be grown over such a large area? Most of this soil is glacial till. When glaciers bulldozed their way over North America and then melted away, the sediments they were dragging dropped and settled. Prairie soils range from 30 to 100 meters deep in places, so even though we have seen a lot of this soil erode away, it has still remained productive. The other thing that helps is that a lot of these soils are pedicles, so they do not receive nearly as much rain as other regions. This actually is beneficial because it preserves the water-soluble nutrients from either being washed away or absorbed by trees that would grow in these places if there was enough rain. Despite that, in order to grow the sheer amount of food that we do in this region, which is an amount that is highly unnatural, fertilizers and irrigation must be used in almost every region. Now for a few bad soil types. One is loess. Loess is soil that is built up and deposited from wind-blown sediments. Earlier I said that sediments that accumulate from water are called alluvium. Wind-accumulated sediments are collectively known as aeolian. Because loess soils are built up rapidly from the wind, it's not chemically weathered, and so there's very little clay. This means the soil is vulnerable to weather and wind erosion. Some of the highest rates of soil loss in the world occur in loess soils, especially in regions of China, where sediments from the high desert plains accumulate, but then it washes away. Despite the high rate of erosion, loess soils can be productive. Finally, there are the badlands. While there is a Badlands National Park, those are not the only badlands. They exist in other states and in many other countries. Badlands are characterized as areas of soft, sedimentary rock that is heavily eroded, but does not produce regolith. Instead, the sediments remain very large, and the lack of rainfall produces virtually no clay or other very fine sediments. Grasses and some hardy trees can grow in badlands, but they are not what you would call highly productive ecosystems. Soil is the most important resource for agriculture, and next time we will talk about agriculture as a science and as a practice, and how there have really been three agricultural revolutions. Thanks for watching.